My name's Alison or Ali Carley. I'm an agroecologist based in the Ecological Sciences Department of the James Hutton Institute, and I'm based at our Dundee site, as Johnny mentioned. And today I'm going to um, talk about uh, the title of my research is about integrated pest management of aphids and why diversity matters in successful pest control. I'll just give you a very brief overview of the James Hutton Institute in case some of you haven't come across us before. We're a split site institute. We have a campus in Dundee and another one in Aberdeen. And we're a very multidisciplinary research organization. So we have soil scientists, plant scientists, ecologists, geographers, social scientists, and a whole range of other people. We're organized into five science departments and our research aims to deliver the needs of government policy, uh, we work with the agricultural industries and stakeholders in the agricultural sector, land use, heritage agencies and environmental protection. And we host a number of long term research platforms and we have various flagship initiatives, some of which are, are, are shown on this slide. Our, search, our, our research is organised around our science strategy, and that is divided into a number of research challenges, which we currently have four. These um, science challenges are championed by science challenge leaders. There are three of us. I'm one, currently one of them, and, and we have that post for a two year period. And much of my, res what my the, the um, area that my um, research is challenging is uh, in the in mainly contributing towards towards challenges three and four. But actually, the research in our group covers all of the challenges listed here. We have three research farms which cover the main land uses in Scotland of arable horticulture and upland farming. And today I'd like to focus on research which largely contributes towards the first science challenge by contributing to integrated pest management approaches. Integrate, integrated pest management is considered as one of the, the, one of the key tools for promoting the sustainable use of, of pesticides. And this um, this has been promoted by the EU through their di directive on sustainable pesticide use. So IPM is a key tool to reduce pesticide use and to, where possible, replace crop protection chemicals with other interventions. And these may be biological or physical, but non-chemical interventions where possible. IPM is built around four key components, which include involves monitoring pests for when they occur and when they start to, to to reach levels that need where they need control, intervening early within a pest outbreak, and then evaluating the efficacy of these intervention measures and iteratively improving them to minimize the chances of further pest outbreaks. Non-chemical control measures, measures are preferred where possible if they're effective, and there is particular emphasis on encouraging natural pest control. And you can find out more about the EU's sustainable um, pesticide use directive at the website at the bottom there. Now, this, this emphasis on natural pest control really raises a few questions because we're familiar with the concept that, that pesticide use, use of insecticides, has been a strong driver for the development of insecticide resistance amongst arthropod pests, leading to reduced efficacy of pesticides. So in the search for alternative pest controls, particularly biological controls, there is more um, evidence coming to light that there are factors that Influ could influence the, the efficacy of biological control. So it raises questions about whether there is natural variation within pest populations in their resistance to biological control, as there is for um, resistance to pesticides. And if that variation exists, what, what, is, what are the underpinning traits and mechanisms? Uh, ideally, even what is the genetic control? And will there be consequences of this variation for integrated pest management that relies on biological control interventions? If you do a search of the literature for using terms like biocontrol resistance or resistance to biological control, you don't throw up a huge number of, of papers, but there are a few examples about where that resistance exists. Now, in my talk, I'm going to focus on biological control of insect herbivores using the, the insect natural enemies, particularly Hymenopterus parasitoids, but it's worthwhile keeping in mind that biocontrol can include predators of, of insect pests and it, can include biointecticides, which might 
mean microbes, pathogens that infect insects, or microbial products or plant compounds that are toxic to insect pests. But I'm going to focus on, on uh, natural enemies, particularly parasitoids. Biological control using these natural enemies of pests typically involves um, augmenting local populations of natural enemies, for example, through mass release programs, or by conserving and promoting native populations of natural enemies, for example, by providing resources that are in limited supply, such as um, wildflower margins to provide nectar and pollen. Although there are limited examples in the literature of biocontrol resistance, there are some recent studies that have highlighted examples where biocontrol resistance has been detected. And an example shown here. This example was um, from New Zealand, where a ryegrass weevil, weevil was an introduced pest of, New Ze of, of grass pastures in New Zealand. And so a parasitoid was introduced to control these, this weevil. But within a few years of the introduction of this parasitoid, the rates of parasitism of the weevil pest were started to decline. So that within 10 to 12 years, the efficacy of weevil control was diminished. So this, this example highlights how um, an in, that in using bio biological control where resistance developed, it can, can develop within a relatively short time period, similar, similar to how we see pesticide resistance developing in insect pest populations. Our work uh, in, in our group, in our, the agroecology group, focuses on aphids, and these are very successful herbivores, both in natural and agricultural vegetation. And the secret of their success lies in various aspects of their life history. I'm just showing here a very, um, a, 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 an example of um, a, an aphid, using the soybean aphid as an example. There are hundreds of different aphid species across the globe. Um, and they all vary slightly in terms of their life history strategy, but a um, sort of idealized one can be picked out from this image here. Generally, uh, aphids will overwinter as an egg on a, on a woody or perennial host, that egg's being produced by sexual reproduction, and then warming temperatures and, and um, increasing day lengths in the spring will, will trigger the egg to hatch, giving rise to a number of um, female aphid populations that eventually migrate to the summer host. And it's this summer morph which is the most damaging to crop production. Aphids are phloem sap feeding insects, so they have this proboscis that, that um, stylet that um, goes that um, taps into the phloem sap and feeds on the, the sugar rich phloem sap. The, and these um, Summer asexual morphs have, are, are the ones that cause the most damage to crops because of their prodigious capacity to reproduce. Because these summer morphs, shown here, this is a wingless one, but they can be winged. They're viviparous, so they give birth to live young, as you can see in this picture here. They're parthenogenetic, so eat their young, each of their young is a clonal reproduction of the, of the aphid mother. They're all female. And not only that, but each nymph when it's born, such as this one shown here, is already has all of the embryos of the offspring it will ever produce. They're already developed within the, uh, the, the nymph tissues. And not only that, but the embryos within that nymph are also, um, have also been, uh, have got all the embryos that they, of the offspring they will ever produce packed within those nymph tissues, that those embryo tissues. So this is what's known as telescoping of generations, that each generation of aphids is packed inside the next one. And it highlights their prodigious capacity to reproduce because as soon as that nymph becomes adult, it's capable of, of um, giving birth to a large number of nymphs. And the generation time is relatively short, say up to say around 10 days in benign conditions. There's no pupation phase to delay the, the um, reproductive cycle. So this means that aphids can turn over new generations very quickly, leading to back rapid buildup of numbers. And you can do this sort of back of the envelope um, calculations as I've done here, that one adult aphid, such as shown in the image here, weighing approximately one milligram, could, um, could give rise to a 10 to the six fold increase in aphid mass within a relatively short period in four to five weeks. And this illustrates why they are um, capable of responding very quickly to strong drivers such as pesticide use. 
Aphids inflict da damage to crops in several ways through direct feeding and removal of resources, through um, causing distortion of, of plant tissues as they grow, and the honeydew that they produce. So this fl the phloem sap that they imbibe, they don't use all of the sugars in their metabolism and they ingest quite a high proportion of those sugars in their honeydew. And this provides a carbohydrate rich resource when it falls onto plant surfaces for um, microbes to grow on bacteria, sooty molds, which can spoil the crop. But the main way that aphids cause problems for um, crop production and reduce yield is through transmission of, of plant viruses that cause disease. An example shown here are, of some plots from a barley field. These will be very familiar to Johnny. Um, where they are the, you can see this yellowing of the of the the plots here, which is due to the transmission of barley yellow dwarf virus by Rapalocyphum pedae, the bird cherry oat aphid. So yield losses in um, caused in by aphids uh, due to virus transmission in Europe alone have been estimated to be in the range of hundreds of thousands of euros. Aphids are attacked by uh, various different types of natural enemies. These include predators such as ladybirds, both the adults and the offspring, the larvae of, of lacewings and hoverflies, and more generalist predators such as spiders and ground beetles. They're also attacked by parasitic wasps, which we'll talk about in a lot more detail in a minute, and by a range of um, generalist and specialist entomopathogenic fungi. All of these natural enemy groups can be purchased as biological control products and parasitoid wasps are particularly favoured in protected grown environments. Many, many years ago, my first postdoc at the University of York, I was tasked with studying the factors that influence aphid population dynamics in potato crops. And through three years of research, we showed that in the absence of pesticide use, these summer asexual aphid numbers build up in potato crops in the early summer, reaching a peak around a bit early to mid-July. And thereafter, the numbers decrease quite rapidly, leaving the crop virtually aphid-free by, by August. A series of field experiments and, and glasshouse experiments that we carried out showed that aphids, the, the factors influencing this rapid buildup of aphid numbers um, early in the summer was due to immigration of aphids, that's not surprising, but also the fact that the young, the immature potato plants were highly suitable for aphid colonization. They were nutritious and very easily, readily colonized by aphids. Whereas during this crash phase of the aphid population, the plants became less suitable as hosts for aphids. They were both physically and less, and less nutritious for aphids. And more in particular, we saw a buildup in the abundance and activity of natural animals, both predators and parasitic wasps, which caused a decrease, which, which caused an increase in aphid mortality. So focusing on those parasitic wasps, parasitoids are natural enemies of insects such as aphids that use the insect as a host for their developing offspring. An example shown here for Aphidius irvi, which is a common generalist parasitoid of, aph of many aph different aphid species and is often used as a biocontrol agent. They are supplied in these vials, which have a little um, lid that's pulled open, and then the wasps come out of these holes here. You can see one on the vial here. This is in a strawberry crop. Parasitic wasps, such as Aphidius irvi, attack aphids by, laying, by inserting their ovipositor into the aphid, bod aphid body and laying an egg. And this primary egg, once inside the aphid tissues, hatches into a secondary egg, and then that hatches to, and then a, and a larva emerges. The larva starts to consume the aphid from the inside out, growing and developing until it eventually pupates. The, uh, by which time the aphid is dead, it's generally this sort of brown husk called a mummy. And once the um, insect has pupated, the emerging wasp, which may be male or female, emerges, it drills a hole in the side of the mummy and emerges from, from the mummy case. There was, there's, over the last 10 to 20 years, there's been increasing evidence emerging from the field of aphid research showing that aphids show natural variation in their susceptibility to parasitism. And the potential concerns that this raises for aphid biocontrol was highlighted by Christoph Vorberger at ETH Zurich a few years ago. 
In, this, in his article, Christophe reviewed the existing evidence for aphid resistance to parasitoid control resulting from, and this resistance was largely attributed to aphid infection with facultative bacterial endosymbionts. Now, and for those, I don't know how many of you are familiar with aphid biology, but all aphids, or nearly all aphids, are infected with an obligate, sometimes called primary bacterial endosymbiont, which is called Buchner aphidic, aphidicola. And they harbored inside specialized structures within the aphid tissues, and they've been shown <clears throat> for <clears throat> research spanning decades that they play an essential role in supplying nutrients to the aphids that are in short supply in the aphids' phloem sap diet and that the aphid cannot synthesize for itself. So these uh, include essential amino acids and some vitamins. Um, but aphids, like many herbivorous insects and, um, and um, other types of insects, blood feeding insects, for example, can also harbor facultative bacterial endosymbionts, which are not essential for insect survival, and they're not present in every individual or in every population, but where they are present, they can confer various fitness effects, which are summarized in this table. For, so there's a, a, quite a number of these facultative endosymbionts have been identified, and four of them have been shown through various studies in the literature to provide protection against parasitism by parasitic wasps. You can have a look at those studies in the literature for examples of how, that, um, how effective that protection is, but I'm just going to show you an example here from an, a master's project study, um, which was carried out in our lab a few years ago. And what we did was we took four different P aphid lines, two of them had none of these facultative endobacteria symbionts, and two of the aphid lines had a, actually had a dual infection with the symbionts called Hamilton Defensa and X-type. And those aphid lines were exposed to attack by aphidia cervi, either a single attack or they were attacked twice in what uh, um, a, phenomenon, a phenomenon that's known as super parasitism. So when two or more eggs are laid into the aphid body. And then we observed those aphids over a period of 10 to 12 days to see how many of them became mummified. And what we found was that um, in the two P aphid lines where there were no facultative end symbionts, we had moderate to high levels of, of mummification of parasitism. But in the two aphid lines that had this dual symbiont infection, there was absolutely no mummification. So this symbiont infection combination was highly effective at providing resistance to parasitism in P. aphids. Much of our aphid research has in fact used the potato aphid, Maxocyphum euphorbia, as a research model. So I'm just going to give you a very brief introduction to this species. It's North American in origin, but it's been present in the UK and more widely in Europe since um, the early 1900s. It's highly polyphagous. It's thought to feed on at least 200 plant species and more than 20 plant families, and can damage plants in the same way that, that any aphid species can, um, particularly through virus transmission. And in, in the UK and, and in Europe, it's one of the problems that it causes for potato crop production is in the transmission of potato leaf roll virus. But it's a pest of several horticultural crops, not just potato, including fruit crops such as raspberry and strawberry and tomato. In Scotland, we have a particular concern because we, um, the Scottish sea potato industry is a very valuable industry in Scotland. And traditionally, we've had a very low virus pressure because our climate has not favoured aphids to the same extent as further south. However, as the climate is changing, we're finding that the aphid pressure and the virus pressure is also changing. There's actually two aphid species that are of particular concern um, infesting potato crops in the UK and further afield. So one of those is Maxocyphum euphorbia that I've just mentioned, and the other is Mises persicae. And what I'm showing you here is data from the aphid suction traps and the insect suction traps that are hosted across Scotland. There are four of them. We host one at the James Hutton Institute here at Dundee. And these um, sample the aerial flotsam at, at a height of 15 meters above the ground. And those and the daily catches are collected and sent to the Scottish Advisory um, Service for identification. And then they put the numbers of the um, what they call the bulletin species, the aphid species which are known to transmit crop viruses. Are, are published weekly. And this information is used by farmers and agronomists to make decisions about when to, to 
protect their crops against um, aphids and virus um, um, and virus transmission. So if we look at the data for, so last year, two, 20, uh, 2022 was a very high aphid pressure year for us in Scotland, um, quite unprecedented compared to previous years. And you can see that for this last week in June, early July, that the numbers of macrocyphon euphorbi were twice, were, were, were three times higher than the, the numbers for the previous year and twice as high as the previous 10 year average. Similarly, for Mises persici, we saw numbers three times higher than this last year than we did in the previous three-year average. So we're not only experiencing the highest potato aphid infestation levels in recent history, we're also facing a situation where aphicides are being withdrawn and the sea potato, the sea potato industry really needs to find effective alternatives. On the potato aphid many years ago, very little was known about its susceptibility to parasitism. And one of my first PhD students, Hannah Clark, surveyed the potato aphid lines in our collection to quantify parasitism. She showed that there were three aphid lines with very low susceptibility to parasitism. So this is parasitism by Ophidia cervi that I introduced earlier. These three aphid lines belong to a single genotype, the red one, which was different to all these other colored genotypes, which um, the susceptible potato aphid lines belong to. Now, although macrocyphon euphorbi can harbor these facultative endosymbionts that have been shown in other aphids to provide protection against parasitism, in the potato aphid, we don't see any evidence that they're associated with parasitism resistance. And that's illustrated in these figures here. If we look at the um, symbols which are which are open, which are unfilled. These are the aphid lines which contain the are infected with Hamilton Alla defensa, which is sometimes called a protective symbiont. And the filled symbols are the are the aphid lines which have no facultative end symbionts. And what you can see is that the um, we have lines that are highly susceptible to parasitism that both contain Hamilton Alla defensa or not, and equally we have lines that are resistant that either have Hamilton Alla defensa or are not infected. So the symbiont Hamilton Alla defensa doesn't seem to be responsible for parasitism protection, at least in our study system of potato aphid. What Hannah, uh, Hannah carried out a series of experiments to understand what at what point the parasitism process started to um, started to break down when it to uh, try and understand the mechanisms for parasitism resistance. And what she showed was that the resistant aphid genotype, very imaginatively we called it genotype one, these are the circles um, symbols here, they all contained a parasitoid egg just as did the, the susceptible potato um, aphid lines, uh, the genotypes that were susceptible. But when she dissected those aphids a few days after parasitism, she showed that very few of the resistant aphids, uh, aphids of the resistant genotype contained a larva, whereas larva, larvae could be detected in the aphids from the susceptible genotypes. So in the potato aphid, this susceptibility to parasitism or resistance to parasitism, the um, pro parasitism process starts to fail at some point between oviposition and larval development. Surprisingly, this resistance to parasitism didn't, doesn't appear to affect other fitness characteristics. And Hannah looked at a whole range of life history traits, such as fecundity, the resistant genotype, those, those circular symbols were showed relatively high fecundity, short time to development time to adulthood, and high survival compared with the, the susceptible, the parasitism susceptible genotypes. And in fact, some follow-on um, projects have also failed to detect any fitness trade-offs. So for example, Mark Whitehead, who finished his PhD three years ago, he looked at three of the potato aphid genotypes, including the resistant genotype one. And he exposed both nymphs and adults of those genotypes to a cold shock. So the nymphs were acclimatized to a 10 degree um, temperature for three days. And then half of the aphids was subjected to minus five degrees. Um, we didn't. We mainly saw effects in the in the adults, so the ten day old aphids in this bottom panel of the graph. But there was for the genotype one aphids, there was actually very little difference between the cold shocked and the control treated aphids for two different aphid lines of that genotype. 
whereas in the parasitism susceptible genotypes, we saw a noticeable decrease in survival in response to cold shock in, in both of these genotypes. We've also looked at potential trade-offs with insecticide resistance, as that's, this is one of the dominant drivers in agricultural set, settings. Now, there's not very much known about point mutations that lead to insecticide resistance in the potato issue genome, but um, esterase activity or carboxyl esterase activity is an indicator of um, aphid metabolic capacity to detoxify xenobiotics such as pesticides. So we work with Steve Foster at Rothamsted Research who, had, who, who can assay aphids for esterase activity. And we assayed a whole range of aphid lines collected from geographically diff, uh, distant places and covering five different potato aphid genotypes. And we did detect variation in esterase activity, illustrated on the left side, hand side here. These are relative these esterase activities are sort of low to moderate um, activities that you might find within um, aphids in, in agricultural settings. Um, but when we look at to see if there's any link between um, esterase activity and parasitism resistance, what we find is that our parasitism resistant genotype is showing one of the higher levels of esterase activity. So there doesn't seem to be any trade-off with, with ability to, to detoxify pesticides. Not only that, but when we expose the parasitism resistant and susceptible aphid genotypes to other natural enemies, including and these are predators such as ladybird larvae and lacewing larvae, we find that the resistant aphid lines, these pink bars here, are more likely to show defensive behaviors towards these predators than are the susceptible um, potato aphid genotypes. And these defensive behaviors include things like kicking, walking away, dropping off the plant, or wriggling about. So you would expect these parasitism-resistant aphid lines to dominate in aphid populations as they seem to have high levels of fitness in all of the traits that we look at. But our most recent survey of potato fields shows that this isn't the case, that our parasitism resistant genotype, genotype 1, we can find it, but it's at relatively low frequencies compared to, say, genotypes 2 and 3, which are much more common and are susceptible to parasitism. So this is, these findings are quite perplexing because when we compare our work with, with research in other aphid species, research, other research has been able to detect in in species such as um, um, Aphis fabi and Cercicidum pisum, they can detect fitness consequences of symbiont conferred parasitism resistance, at least to some extent, even if it doesn't lead to complete aphid mortality. But why is what we don't understand is why the potato aphid is different. How are these apparently super fit aphids with all these really fantastic fitness traits? Why are they not more prevalent? A potential answer was revealed by one of my colleagues at the James Hutton Institute who works on insect population dynamic modeling. And we'd been discussing the work and then she came across this paper in the literature. And what this study ha had been looking at was the factors that lead to coexistence of two different pest beetle species. One of, when they, when they, the two beetle species are, are given the same living conditions, one of them was much more strongly competitive for resources and competitively excluded the other. But when a parasitoid was introduced into the system, the two beetle species coexisted. And this was because the parasitoid showed learning, host, uh, was able to, to increase their preference for one of the beetle species through learning, that they got used to the more common beetle type the stronger competitor, and so we're better at attacking it than the, the weaker but less prevalent beetle type. So we, were one, we wondered whether this could potentially explain the maintenance of susceptible and resistant genotypes in potato aphid populations that we see in our data. So Catherine and I set out to test this using a, um, a modeling approach. She, Catherine constructed a stage structured model of aphid, aphid parasitoid dynamics, so incorporating the aphid and parasitoid life cycle, but also a com, um, taking into account we have two different types of aphids. We have parasitism susceptible and resistant types. The um, uh, Holling type 2 
a functional response is used to, to describe the interaction between the, the density of the aphid population and the, rather than the number of prey consumed with a parasitoid, it's the number of hosts attacked. And when there was no learning incorporated into this population dynamic model, and the model was parameterized using data that had been collected from our own experimental studies, Catherine showed that we could only get coexistence of the susceptible, the defended or resistant aphid type and the parasitoid when the success rate of the parasitoid on these two aphid types was equal. So it was equally good at parasitizing both the susceptible and the resistant one. And we know that that isn't the case. However, if parasitoids learn to attack common aphid types preferentially over less common types, then Catherine's, um, Catherine, we, Catherine's modeling showed a different outcome. So what we've done here, just to explain it in very general terms, is we've introduced what we call a switching cost. And what this does is um, it, it paints the scenario that in a situation where you have one very common or dominant aphid type, the parasitoid gets used to, becomes conditioned to attacking that aphid type. So that when it encounters a different aphid type that's less common and it's not become um, habituated to, it is less successful at attacking it. And this is this switching cost is, is observed, is, is coded into the model in terms of the attack rate. So when it's attacking the common aphid type, it shows a high attack rate against that type but encountering a less common type, it shows a lower attack rate. So we modeled the scenario where we, we speculated that in the presence of high levels of parasitism, that the resistant aphid type would be more common. But when the parasitoid encounters the, the susceptible type, it shows a lower attack rate. And the simulations from the, the models shows that in, when we encode this switching cost into, into the model, that it leads to coexistence of the resistance and susceptible types with realistic levels of resistance and susceptibility or um, success of mummification in the two types. So this, um, so it seems that parasitoid learning can stabilize the system and allow resistant and susceptible aphids to coexist along with, with the parasitoid. The actual value of the attack rate alpha is determines what kind of system dynamics we see. So at a relatively low attack rate, we sort of see a few, we see early oscillations and then it stabilizes at a given um, level. Whereas at a higher attack rate, we the the populations go into these kind of dynamic oscillations. Why does this matter? Well, this for, for us, this was exciting because although it's only a theoretical study, it potentially provides a novel mechanism to explain the fitness costs of parasitism resistance in aphids, where the fitness cost isn't experienced by the aphid, it's experienced by the parasitoid. But more generally for ecological modeling studies, this, this mechanism is potentially one that could explain how diversity is maintained more generally in insect communities. And it's already generated some interest in, amongst our colleagues and eco uh, ecologist colleagues. We are, we are developing this model further and, and, and using it in different ways because we think it has potential to, to help in optimizing biological control. It could be used, for example, to decide which parasitoid species to release. So I've been talking here about single in parasitoid species interacting with a different aphid types, but actually we know that in natural communities and even in biocontrol um, products, that they are generally being attacked by several different parasitoid species. And in fact, the literature shows that, that um, a resistance to one parasitoid species doesn't necessarily mean that the aphid is resistant to another aphid species. So it could be used to optimize which parasitoid species to use and when, and also whether other types of biological controls such as predators are, are going to be introduced. It also could be used to explore whether um, more virulent parasitoids could be developed and could be released in, in biological control programs and could be used to tailor parasitoid release to environmental conditions because we've been using the model to, to simulate different um, conditions of abiotic stress, which can differentially affect the aphid types. Having shown you in a great amount of detail now the evidence of the existence of parasitism resistance in potato aphid that's, that's encoded by the aphid genome, 
I now want to come back to earlier in my talk, which was the observation from the aphid literature that resistance to parasitism is often conferred by facultative bacterial end symbionts. Because although we don't find an association between symbiont presence and resistance, parasitism resistance in potato aphid, we have, um, through other experiments, shown that there are fitness consequences of symbiont infection that could affect biological control. An example shown here, where um, several experiments, actually, this is just one of them, have shown that Hamilton, aphid infection with the symbiont Hamilton Alla Defensa affects the way that plants allocate mass to the roots. So when, aphid, when plant, potato plants are infested with aphids, they reduce the proportion of their mass to the roots. But this reduction is much greater when the aphids feeding on the plants are infected with Hamilton Island Defensa. And we've seen this in more than one study. We don't know the explanation for this, um, but the answer might come from um, another piece of work, another PhD student, uh, Daniel Laban's work, Daniel finished his PhD um, four years ago, and he was working with the bird Cheriotaphis Rapalocyphin pedi. Rapalocyphin pedi, um, when infected with Hamiltonella defensa, these aphids are actually resistant to their parasitoid, which is another aphidious species, aphidious species called Aphidius colmani. And Daniel used the electropenetration graph, which is um, to monitor feeding behavior and the effects of symbiont infection on aphid feeding. This um, methodology basically wires the aphid up to an electrical system and looks at changes in resistance as the aphid silet penetrates the plant material and as the aphid probes through to the phloem sap. And I won't go into all the details of the different waveforms that this generates and how it's interpreted, but the data that, Jan that Daniel generated comparing symbionts infected and uninfected with palisanthropaidae aphids showed that the um, symbionts infected aphids generally showed a larger number, more rapid probing of the plant tissue and much shorter probes. So it was probing into the tissue uh, more frequently and for very short periods. But when they reached the phloem, they were more likely to show sustained phloem feeding. And this hints at the fact that um, infection with this symbiont Hamiltonella defensa is somehow influencing how aphids feed on plant material. It also potentially raises the question of whether symbiont infection by influencing aphid feeding could be influencing um, virus transmission by aphids. There's also another little bit of indirect evidence of the effects of Hamiltonella defensa on aphid feeding because another PhD student, Desiree Makeda, who's just finishing her thesis corrections at the moment, she's been studying the, the potato aphid and she carried out, a, she was interested in knowing whether the symbiont infection with Hamiltonella defensa influenced how aphids were, at prep, um, if it influenced parasitoid preference for the aphid. So she collected honeydew from um, aphids, potato aphids that either contained Hamiltonella infection or had no symbiont infection, feeding on potato plants. And she used two different genotypes of potato aphid. They're both parasitism susceptible. And one of the first interesting things she showed was that if the aphids were infected with Hamiltonella, they produced more honeydew than if they were uninfected with Hamiltonella. And then when she presented the honeydew from those aphids and the parasitoids, the Fidia cervi was given a choice of honeydew from symbiont infected aphids and uninfected aphids, they always showed a preference for the symbiont infected aphids. And we've linked this to the fact that, that there was more honeydew produced by these, by these aphids. And so parasitoids are going to the, the better source of honeydew and parasitoids use honeydew as a source of sugars. Um, because Desiree looked at the, the composition of volatiles produced by the honeydew from these two different aphid types and she didn't see any compositional differences. And finally, um, another aspect that, um, that, that is worth considering is that, um, is that the, 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 the presence of um, parasitism resistance in potato aphids, or more generally of, of parasitism, whether it's encoded by the, the genome or by, by symbionts, may influence how other um, integrated pest management measures might be incorporated into an IPM strategy. 
And this is highlighted by um, some work with a close colleague of mine, Alison Bennett, who was at the Institute for many years, but now, is now at Ohio State University. And she and I worked together over many years while she was here, looking at um, different aspects of interactions between plants and their root symbionts, arbuscular mycorrhizae, and insects and their symbionts, so aphids and their, and their facultative end symbionts. And through the large amount of data that was generated by these projects over several years, Alison conducted a machine learning analysis to, under, to assess what were the main um, influences on the outcomes of these interactions, whether that was in terms of plant fitness or in terms of herbivore fitness. And herbivore genotype here and here was shown to be one of the main uh, one of the most significant predictors of the outcome or the variation in the outcome of these multitrophic interactions. So this implies that within species diversity in aphid pest populations could have important effects on the use of other non-chemical methods used in pest control, such as here where we're using arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi not only to promote plant growth, but also to stimulate plant immune responses to insect herbivores. So just to summarize, sum up um, and return to the questions that I, that I posed right at the beginning, we, um, with, the, with, the, with increasing evidence for, for um, the or increasing potential use of biological control, controls in, for pest control, is there variation in pest resistance to these biocontrols? Well, I think the answer is yes, we, there is significant evidence for both genome encoded and symbiont encoded resistance to parasitism, for example. Um, but in terms of what the mechanisms are, well, we, we have an, a hint at what those mechanisms might be. Um, but, we, but in terms of the trade-offs, we don't really detect very many trade-offs in terms of aphid fitness. So resistant genotypes don't dominate, despite the fact that there's no clear trade-off with the fitness trait, with aphid, other aphid fitness traits. And in fact, our theoretical modeling has shown that, that, um, that if the fitness cost is experienced by the parasitoid, then this may be a novel mechanism to explain how diversity of aphid genotypes is maintained within natural populations. And in terms of considering what the likely impacts of this understanding is for integrated pest management, well, we think that this information, that the data and knowledge that's generated by our research and by other researchers in this field has important uh, consequences and should be incorporated into understanding the impacts of diversity on, um, integrate, on development of integrated pest management strategies and in terms of monitoring um, pest pest populations and outbreaks because it could inform the choice and timing of biological controls and, and other IPM interventions. And most importantly, because the, the, whole, um, the whole driver behind promoting the use of biological controls is for the sustainable use of pesticides, well, we would argue that, that actually we also um, need to consider the sustainable use of biological controls in IPM strategies so that we don't end up with the same situation that we are with some pesticides where the overuse of certain biological controls has led to development of resistant populations. So finally, um, just to say the, the work I presented here, as you've probably seen, has covered many projects over many years um, of research. And I've tried to make sure that everybody who is involved is named here on this, on this final slide, and also to acknowledge the various funding sources that have supported this research. And thank you very much for listening. I hope there's been something um, that you can glean from this talk that's relevant and useful for you. And I'm happy to take any questions.